and I trust that he's also ready um, and almost will join us soon. Yes, he will, definitely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, Godfrey. Hi, Godfrey. This is Anna. How are you? Hi, Anna. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Long time. Long time indeed. Are you well? Mm -hmm. Yes, very well. Uh -huh. Okay, very surviving very the well. summer. Nice to have there. you. Oh, I'm, I don't mind at all. For me, I'm, I feel at home with the heat. Ah, that's good. Sorry, I see that we are already recording. Okay, Candela, I read you now. Yeah, I, I fear, like fearing that I would forget lately. I'd okay. rather do it now and then just edit the video and start when that's, we start. But that's we good, have, that's good. It's on the cloud, okay? Yes, once it's in the cloud, it's quite easy to edit the video from there. Perfect, Great thank you. No problem. I see that uh, when I start recording, then it shows that everybody's recording. Is that yes. right? Yes, yes, okay. it's correct. But only one, uh, only one person can start it. So uh, I mean, now I could stop it for you. So I just tell to all the other uh, co-hosts uh, <laughs> to try not to touch the the recording, so that we have only one person <laughs> doing it. But yes, it's visible for everyone of the co-host and host. Okay. I just have Mrs. Pilar in. Okay, very good. Hi, Pilar, can you hear us? Yeah, she's there. Okay. <laughs> Ah, okay. Hi, uh, Pilar. Hi, hi. Um, I put the, uh, yeah, the background, but I don't know how do you see the background. Uh, it seems it's uh, inverted. No, I think it's uh, it's fine. I think we see it in the right. The we right. See, uh, yeah, everyone around the table, private sector and healthy diets. Okay, okay, thank you. No, because I, from uh, my perspective, it's, it looks like uh, inverted, but uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's mirrored. Yeah. Um, great, I think that um, Siobhan told me that it didn't work for her. <laughs> so yeah. it, it depends on what you have in the back, but it looks great. Yeah, okay, perfect. That's very useful. So who will monitor the participants coming in? Will all of us or only Fabio um, at, um, um, after one, as of one o'clock? I, th I think all of us can, if, if we can. So for the moment, we're just waiting for the other speakers to come. So I hope that they will join before one so that we can run the, the tests. Uh, and then just please let me know when we should start uh, with the introduction, if you want to wait some, a couple minutes after one. Uh, I mean, also depending on the number of people that will join immediately at one, because for the moment we have 184 registrations. Okay, I think that Steve will lead on that. And then as soon as he starts talking, Julian knows what she's doing on the slides and then we know what we're doing on the chat. I have just submitted Uduak. Hi Uduak, can you hear okay, us? Perfect. She's part of the first panel um, and again Hi. colleague. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, there's a bit of echo in your room. Number one. Maybe it's not. I don't want to have a device, so there should be an echo. It's an empty room, so. 
Maybe that's why. Are you sure you selected the correct headset in your audio? Because maybe it's a matter of um, selecting the correct tool. If you go on the, the little arrow next to the microphone icon, you should be able to double check. any better I think so can you speak some more okay um, how is the light in the background? yeah the lighting's good and the audio is much better than before right everyone okay. all right, all right. Good. It's Bye. Perfect. thanks Julia correct thank you ambassador Yaya is in the waiting room I'll admit Siobhan as well Yes, please admit. One thing I'm slightly worried about, not too much, but the, the, the simultaneous translation rules in English, I'm finding them challenging. For someone who needs that, who's a Spanish or French speaker, it's going to be almost incomprehensible. So do we have a, a go-to that people can go to in the chat box for help? Um, I'm just reading those five bullet points. They are quite complicated. If you're listening to that, as someone who needs the interpretation because your English is not great. It's quite complicated. Um, I guess we can post those there. We don't have them in French or Spanish, do we, the rules? Um, unfortunately not, but maybe we can ask Deborah if, if they have something uh, ready. Yeah. If not, we can try and improvise something. Yeah, yeah the thing is that if you, if you read them, they will be translating them. And I think that every time you turn your audio on and off, uh, the interpretation bubble comes up saying that there is interpretation available and you can. Okay, so, okay, so I should read these through so the interpreters would um, um, uh, be, be translating them as, well, as I go forward, that's fine, okay. I may then change the order. I think I'll start with that because we want for everything else, we want it to be um, translated. So I'll start with the simultaneous translation. So let me quickly um, switch the slides then. Yeah, sorry. You, I think that will make more sense for people. Absolutely. I've just let in also Diane. Hello, everybody. How are you today? All good. Thank you. Good. I'll put you back on mute unless you need me. Sure, thanks. Thank and you, also Diane. is in now. Hi, everybody. Hi. Team on five Hi. minutes. Who's excited? Hello. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Welcome. You too. Hi, Sharada. This is Anna. And Hi, I'm Anna. Hi, Hello. You? Yeah, good. Looking forward to uh, good. taking notes. Hi, Anna. Good. Hi, Hi, Toko. How are, are you? you? Good, good. Hello, Toko. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to admit also Marcela. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi, welcome. In luck, admit.
I think someone's asking if there's no sound and yeah, there's no sound except, you know, me speaking right now. Great, thank you, Julia. Since I sent the invitation to Lawrence, he's got my name on it. We've got to change that. I will do that. I'm adding Beth to the room and Andrew. So Andrew now and Beth. I will add Lawrence and rename him. Hi, Andrew and I, Beth. Can you try Hello. to talk so we see if the microphone works? Yes, everything's working well. Hi, Marcella. Hi, it's uh, me, Marcella, and it's working. I so will admit the DG perfect. now, okay? Thank you. Okay, so... Um, yeah, the DJ is with us right now. Okay, excellent. Can anyone hear me? Is Lawrence here? You're fine. Yes. Hi, Lawrence. Hi, Lawrence. Yes. Good. Hi. Great. It's fine. Thank you. Beth, can we quickly test your audio? Sure. Is that workable? Yes. Right. Loud clear. Thank you. Hi. Uh, <laughs> fast. Hello. Hello. Hi, DG. Hi, DG. Hi. Hello. Hi, DG. Hi, how are you? <laughs> so, Fabi, would you like to do it? Uh, we've done the sound check already. It's fine. Yes, we are still waiting for a couple more people for breakout number one and breakout number two. So, but if you want, we can start admitting also the participants and then they will join it a, a, a little bit later. So, as you prefer. I see Theo. Hello, Fabio Lara. I've admitted uh, Theo de Yaga as well as two other people from the breakout sessions now. Perfect. Okay. Hi, hey, DG. Also... Lawrence Haddad here. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hey. You're doing okay? Very good. How are you? Good. I'm good, thank you. You are good. now where are you now, Lars? I'm what? Where are you now? I'm in the UK, in Brighton. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. which, in London? Or? <laughs> in, uh, in England, yes. In the south of London, in a place called Brighton. Oh, very good. Very good. And you? Where are you now? I'm in Iran. I'm in okay. Iran. I'm, okay. I'm blocked. <laughs> not not too bad a place to be locked. Ah, it's good, but uh, here it's very very sunny and dry and uh, a little bit hot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We dream we dream of sunny and hot in the UK. Yeah, I, I, I know you you, <laughs> you but but uh, you grew up with that the uh, misty uh, <laughs> weather. So yes, absolutely. <laughs> Congratulations on the on the Sophia report, by the way. I thought it was fantastic. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, mm. it was uh, Maxima and uh, and uh, yeah. my colleagues, and, and now we have a new uh, blood, yeah, best better. So yeah, yeah, it's really we good. Moving, we are moving more professional, you know. <laughs> you know, I I uh, when I work in the academy, yeah, I didn't realize. It. And then I jumped over to the political cycle. The people always talk to, told, sometimes they complain me, you are so demanding on professional. I said, no, huh? I've already low down eight degree huh? when you see a song. <laughs> <laughs> but still, the, the, you know, uh, we, we keep moving on the professional. So that's why the uh, even software report, every year they got some uh, uh, complaint. Huh? They say, oh, you have to uh, increase our, our numbers and the figures and data. I said, no, I never touched that. That's uh, the economists, they are professionally calculated. Mm -hmm. yeah, even some leaders of a country say, told me, asked the, uh, me to, 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 to talk with them. I said, no, that's, that's a professional. <laughs> I mean, the key, the key thing is that the numbers are, are 
going up and that's that trend hasn't changed at all even if the level is going down that's the key yeah. alarming fact yeah because our population increased and yeah. uh, and uh, and the relatively uh, uh, ratio is uh, going down or stable but the absolute number is go up definitely that's because the contribution from south asia and the parts of uh, africa so that's a two uh, 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 Hot spot, we can yeah. say that. it's that's yeah. really you know if 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 uh, India, Pakistan, and uh, Bangladesh, those three countries, they they com contribute uh, more than forty percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some <laughs> astonishing numbers in that report. Yeah. N new yeah. new numbers for me. I didn't know them. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, that's that's challenging for us. Also yeah. in Nigeria, you, you know, yeah. They, there are so many uh, population increase. Eh? That's a big challenge for us. Sorry to interrupt you. So we're yeah, starting. We should start. In a, okay. So yeah. now I'm admitting all the people from the waiting room. Okay. So Please. thank you, Steve. Okay, people are entering now in the in the virtual meeting. Would you like to start? You're muted, Steve. Yeah. Okay. okay, welcome to everybody, wherever you are, um, whatever time of day or evening it is. My name is Steve Godfrey uh, of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of this, uh, this meeting, co convened by um, Food and Agriculture Organization and GAIN. Um, we um, uh, have a little bit of housekeeping to do before we go to the first session with the Director General and the Executive Director of, of uh, GAIN. I wanted to just run through, we have simultaneous translation, which is available in <clears throat> both Spanish and French, and you can choose your preference in the interpretation menu below. Um, if you wish to listen to English, you select off in that interpretation menu, so you don't get the interpretation. And if you make an intervention in Spanish or French, you need to turn the interpretation off by selecting off in that interpretation menu to speak. So in order to avoid speaker sound getting mixed up with the interpretation, on that interpretation menu, please make sure that original audio is muted so you can hear a clean interpreting feed, only with the language and without the original audio in the background. I know that's a little bit complicated, this slide will be posted to the chat. And if you have difficulties, please send a message in the um, open chat room and we'll try to give you some assistance. The other uh, housekeeping rules, really the format and, and so on. Uh, this is, as you know, a Zoom meeting, which means we can split in the second part into two breakouts. Please make sure that your sound is muted and you turn your video off to limit the uh, call on the broadband. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself, of course, and put your video on when you speak um, or are given the floor. Uh, during the Q&A session, there will be opportunities for feedback, questions, and so on of the speakers. Please use the chat box to signal your in interest in speaking or to, to pose a question, which we can then give consideration to put into the speakers. Um, there'll be further instructions when we move to the breakout sessions, which are going to be led by our colleagues at FAO. And so we'll give you some reminders on the format uh, there. So our day one um, session here, which is going to be kicked off by the um, Chu Dong Yu, the Director General of Food and Agriculture Organization, and Lawrence Haddad, the um, Executive Director of GAIN. And Lawrence will, after these um, introductory remarks by Director General and himself, will lead straight into the first session and will moderate it. So without further ado, please may I invite you, Director General, to make your opening statement. Thank you, Stephen Godfrey. And uh, you pronounce my name very properly, yeah? It's not so easy for you. Eh? Uh, and uh, yeah, dear uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, uh, Haidada, Executive Director of the GAY, and the 2018 World Food Prize recipient. Excellencies, 
distinguished guests. And it's my pleasure to address you in this virtual roundtable convened by FAO and the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Okay. It's a very good uh, uh, accredit. Yeah, okay. we, get, we should get more eh? on the uh, <laughs> theme. Everyone around the table, private sector on a healthy diet. That is the first in the series of three round tables. The objective of this event is to discuss how the private sector can engage strategically in transforming our food systems to deliver high diets. I'm very pleased that FO have partnered with the GANS in this event, GANS vision of the world in which all people consume nutritious and safe food aligned with the FL vision of a world without hunger and malnutrition. In 2019, FL organized a symposium on the future of food, which focused on the contribution of the scientific communities, addressing the challenges of food systems through the scientific innovations. Knowing the crucial role that the private sector plays in the food system, this year, we are focused on the private sector's contribution to food systems transformation to health and death. I always uh, remind you all, you know, in this plan, the most largest group is the private sectors are farmers. No matter big or small, it's family farmers, uh, no any family farmer is uh, public, it's a private. So yes, yes, you talk about private uh, uh, sector equivalent to the uh, company, no. Agricultural sector, yeah? private sector is the, is the majority dominated by uh, family farmers, uh, even cooperative uh, uh, family farmers. So I think we have to revisit uh, the thinking, what is the role of the private sectors in agricultural food? That's different from other sectors, uh, industry, commercial, and, and others, you, you name it. Last week, FAO and the partners launched the State of the Food Security and the Nutrition Report 2020, SOFIA, on the theme of transforming food systems for the affordable health deaths. SOFIA 2020 shows that the 10 million more people become undernourished with respect to the 2018, and 60 more billion did so in the last say, five years. This was before COVID-19. We are now expecting between 83 and 132 million people to be added to this world and nourish the population due to the pandemic. The report also points out that the 3 billion people globally cannot afford a house death. So this is an acceptable situation. Of course, when you talk about the house death, it's a, it's a highest level of the adults. In, in terms of what we are classified. And the findings of the SOFIA report are very relevant to the discussion we are going to have in the next three days. FAO commitment in improving health status is captured in our current biennial theme, promoting health status and providing all forms of malnutrition. The food system transformation we are calling for must they link the solution of food insecurity, increase the access to the health deaths. Food system must be transformed into the resilient and the sustainable and with a focus on the quality deaths. This food system transformation requires all sectors to step up and play a more active role. FO recognize that the private sectors from the farmers to the micro, small and medium enterprises, you see, uh, I included the uh, farmers as a part of the uh, private sector. That's my old my uh, concept. Uh, please, uh, I, I hope you get my message because during past twenty years, I, when I talk about the private sector, always because a lot of people, you know, uh, consider the private sector exclude the farmers. No, it's wrong. Larger companies is uh, at the heart of the food system is the institute in driving this transformation. FAO is currently. Re revising its strategy for engagement with the private sectors. We are doing this through an open interactive cons consultation process with different private sectors and entities uh, providing us with a useful inputs to consider going forward. Over the next three days, 
we will have a dialogue on the raw, the private sectors. I use the pluma, eh? always I use the pluma because when we talk about different type of the private sectors can play the uh, deliver high styles with a special focus on the MSMEs. Yeah? In addition to representing the largest portion of a private sectors, uh, MSME uh, is play the key role in contributing to rural and economic development, provide important employment opportunity, offer the much needed market link of farmers. COVID-19 showed how vulnerable MSME are. They have been the hardest hit of COVID-19 and many have lost their business. Our discussion should also address how MSME can be supported, so have a variable, variable business that can contribute to health diets. To ensure the fruitful dialogue, our roundtable discussion will be multi stakeholders in nature, bringing together government representatives, business producer organizers, organizations, and the MSMEs to uh, discuss how business can contribute to deliver health diets for all. We hope that at the end of the three the round table discussion, we are able to come to agreement or consensus on the key recommendations to scale up action and the commitment for this agenda. I know the health management has started with the health diets. And the health diets started with the agri-food system. That's a logic. So without the uh, uh, health agri-food system, without the health uh, deaths, without the health deaths, without the health management. And then finally, we don't have health uh, situation around the uh, life cycle. So I invite you to join us, thinking together, working together, learning together, and to contribute together for the better tomorrow. And let's do it, and just do it. Thank you. Over to you. Hello? Hi, Steve, you want me to go now? Yeah. So um, this is Lawrence Haddad, uh, again, Executive Director. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Director General uh, Dong Yu for his wise opening remarks, his strong leadership, and for this fantastic SOFI report that was launched last week. And I've written to the team uh, DG and I've written to them and uh, behind it and told them it's the best Sophie yet and I've seen many. Um, the report confirms sobering facts and you, you mentioned them Director General before. Hunger numbers have increased by 60 million in five years and that's before COVID. Another 80 to 130 million will be added in the coming year due to the lockdowns from COVID. Healthy diets are unaffordable to 3 billion people and that's a conservative estimate and 57% of the population in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa cannot afford a healthy diet. That is really, really tragic and sobering, 57%. And I could go on. So for those of us who live to change that dynamic, the private sector is really an ally. Um, all businesses, whether big, medium, small, micro, whether in food, transport, storage, finance, advertising, they all have a role to play. And the rest of us have an incentive to help them to do that. Why is that? What are the motives behind for getting everyone around the table, as the title of the symposium said? And I think they're pretty clear. I think, first of all, progress towards the SDGs is just too slow. COVID's not going to help with that. Moreover, most people buy their food from markets, and therefore they're already engaging with the private sector. So we can't stick our head in the sand. Businesses have to be part of the solution. And governments have a key role to play, of course. They need to do everything in their power to make it easier for businesses to make safe, nutritious food more available, affordable, and desirable. And they need to make it harder for businesses to make unhealthy foods more affordable and available. And what incentives do businesses have to come to this table that we're talking about? Well, many SMEs are already producing nutritious foods. For them, you know, they're, they're producing fruits, vegetables, fish, pulses, eggs, dairy. For them, we need to help them grow their businesses 
and so make nutritious foods more accessible to all. And we can do this through finance, TA for business development and nutrition impact, and via policy incentives. For the bigger businesses who perhaps are not producing as much healthy food, their incentives to change are growing. The demand for healthy diets is building and COVID-19 will only accelerate that. The evidence is becoming clearer on the very positive business returns to healthy employees and healthy work, workforces and value chains. And government regulations, they're not going away. They're gonna become tighter and tighter on business practices that impact nutrition negatively. So for big businesses, the challenge is to become a leader, a pace setter, and to seize the opportunity. So if those are the motivations, what are the means? Well, the UN Food System Summit and the Nutrition for Growth Summit will provide the perfect mechanism, and they are providing the perfect mechanism to accelerate engagement between public and private sectors. Uh, business associations are working together really productively to make significant commitments for the n for g Summit, and I'm sure the UN Food System Summit will build on and learn from that. So we've talked about motives and means for engagement. What about opportunities? Well, change is in the air, colleagues. Things that seemed impossible four months ago now seem to happen on a regular basis. Trillion dollar bailout packages, vaccines developed in record time, and statues that have stood for many centuries all of a sudden toppled. And in fact, food has never been more present in its absence. People in high income countries have never been so aware of where their food comes from, of, the, of food systems and the essential nature of food system workers, never. And people in low income contexts are faced with this terrible daily choice, this terrible choice. Do I get infected with COVID or do I avoid hunger? That shouldn't be a choice. Uh, COVID-19 has been like a time machine, a very strange time machine. It has, pro it has propelled us forward 10 years into the future on many things, such as ways of working. But time machines can also work backwards. And we're at severe risk of development being dragged back by 10 years if we do not fix food systems and fast. And that's our challenge over the next three days, to talk about what we can do together to accelerate the changes we want to see. So day one today is focused on business perspectives. Day two is focused on government and consumer perspectives. What can they do? And day three is focused on the kinds of commitment areas we wanna see developed out in the UN Food System Summit, Action Tracks, and in many other fora. So colleagues, let's, let's reject any notions of development delayed. And then let's instead move our efforts into overdrive. So with those comments, Steve, I'm going to move us on to our first panel. And our first panel is called Business Strategies for the Delivery of Healthy Diets for a Healthy Planet. Now, what is a healthy diet? And we could spend a lot of time on that, but let's not. According to WHO, a healthy diet protects against malnutrition in all its forms, as well as diet-related non-communicable diseases, such as obesity, type two, diabetes, and some cancers. It contains a balanced, diverse, and appropriate selections of foods eaten over a period of time. Um, and it's really important to remember that a healthy diet, and the Sophie report outlined this well, it's important to remember that a healthy diet is not always sustainable, and a sustainable diet is not always healthy. So we want healthy and sustainable diets. Let's keep that in mind. And while we talk in this panel about businesses, this first panel about businesses in general, there will be a focus on small and medium enterprises and micro enterprises. These are businesses with less than 250 employees. And they include, as the DG said, they include smallholder farmers. These businesses and enterprises are the backbone of food systems in low income contexts especially in Africa and Asia. Now we've got a great panel for you and I'm gonna briefly introduce the three panelists before asking uh, Diane the, the first couple of questions and giving her the floor. So Diane Holdorf 
is the Managing Director of Food and Nature at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, or WBCSD. Uh, it's based in Geneva. And before joining WBCSD, Diane was Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer for the Kellogg Company. Um, we, we then will have uh, some comments and questions from uh, Theo Diego, and Theo is the president of the World Farmers, Associate, uh, World Farmers Organization and former president of the Southern Africa Confederation of Agricultural Unions, as well as a former president of the Pan-African Farmers Union. And he's farmed timber and subtropical fruits in South Africa since 1997, and I'm told he also keeps goats, which is very important to remember. Um, and then finally, Uduak Igbeka, and Uduak is uh, the Global Country Support Manager for Scaling Up Nutrition Business Network, SBN, which is the world's leading private sector focused nutrition initiative. And prior to joining the global team, Uduak coordinated the activities of the Scaling Up Nutrition um, Business Network in Nigeria, and under her leadership, increased the number of business members to, over, to well over 100. So we have a stellar panel for you. And without further ado, let me ask Diane uh, to reflect on a couple, of, a couple of questions. So the first couple of questions is, Diane, really what's, what's the responsibility of businesses to improve diet quality? What's the responsibility and, and, and the opportunity? And second, what do you need, what do businesses need other stakeholders to do to make that uh, more likely and more, more feasible? So Diane, let me turn the floor over to you. Lawrence, thank you so much. I'd like to thank you and the DG and everyone who's put this together. It's remarkable three days that we're going to have and we're thrilled to be a part of it and help kick this off today. Let me start with answering your questions, Lawrence, with placing it into just briefly the economic situation. The Food and Land Use Report last year issued a landmark publication called the Growing Better Economics Assessment of the Food System, which documented that although the food system creates 10 trillion US dollars of value, it's actually operating at a $12 trillion loss if all of the environmental and social externalities were included in how companies across the food and agricultural sector were assessed for value and performance. And this two trillion deficit, this two trillion dollar deficit creates huge challenges for the food system and for all of the companies, large and small, that operate as a key part of it. The food sector is also one of the largest employers and these things are creating the types of pressure points that we see now on how we have to really work towards both a healthy planet and super important within that healthy people. The COVID crisis and pandemic has created huge disruptions to food systems, putting twice as many people at risk of hunger than we were already experiencing. And as the truly remarkable, I agree, Sophie 2020 report shows, we were already going in the wrong direction. These create the reason for change, for business and for all who are associated within this. At the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, you know, we've worked in partnership with many of you on these issues. And we've had some leading companies working together in a pre-competitive way, really for several, many years now, on how do we address this issue of nutrition quality, of getting after hunger through supply chains and value chains, and of increasing the overall nutritional quality of their portfolios. There's been many efforts, but there's still much more work to do. And I'd like to just point to a couple of specific examples. And Lawrence, you touched on this already. One of the things that I think gives us great momentum are the key moments in time that we will have next year to and through which we can work to really address 
these gaps that we have still in achieving the sustainable development goals and zero hunger for all. We have the Food Systems Summit and we have the Nutrition for Growth Summit. Both of these create big opportunities for business to demonstrate their existing leadership and to create the frameworks and ambition around new commitments to address these areas. And I can assure everyone that this work is already underway. Let me take just a moment to touch on the work that we've done together with GAIN and others on the Responsible Business Pledge for Better Nutrition that will be coming forward in support of the Nutrition for Growth Summit as well as to the Food Systems Summit. And this is just one example of business recognizing the urgency of this global challenge to improve nutrition as a really central element to achieving the sustainable development agenda, but even more focused now within the COVID world in which we're all learning how to redefine our work and to recreate the types of systems that we need. This is really important for the private sector and, you know, COVID, like nothing else, has actually shown the great inequities that exist. The loss of income has been significantly contributing to these hunger risks. And the pandemic has really highlighted not only the disruptions and risks that we knew existed in the food systems today, but new ones that we hadn't quite anticipated could fail so quickly. So through addressing what we need to be doing through the recovery period of COVID and using those learnings to apply specifically to make our food systems stronger, to assure nutrition from farm all the way to fork, and to demonstrate the leadership that business can, must, and will take is the work that we are doing and still have ahead of us. So there's quite a big reason to be hopeful, but there is important work to be done. Thank you, Diane. Um, I think that's a nice, a nice summary. Lots of, lots of opportunities, um, lots of challenges, um, pressure points on business, but also on other stakeholders. And we need to, we need to find out how to, how to maximize those and leverage those, those pressure points. So thank you very much, Diane. Uduak, I'm, I'm now going to uh, turn the floor over to you. Um, Uduak, and, and a couple of sort of pointers to get you going uh, in your response. You work with thousands of SMEs, uh, Uduak. What are the, what are the, um, what do you see their responsibility? How do they fit into this picture? And, and what are the sort of, one of the top two or three things that are really holding them back from playing an even bigger role in, in making this vision a reality? Over to you, Uduak. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, the SMEs see themselves as being um, the most integral part of the, the food system, especially the local food systems. Uh, these are the businesses that tend to source most of their, the bulk of their raw materials locally. Uh, these are the businesses that produce the raw materials. And so it's, um, their role in, in providing healthy diets, it's critical. Um, uh, and Funny enough, this is the group that tends to know the least about public health issues. Uh, and so if we're looking to really drive change as far as healthy diets are concerned, um, to try and improve dietary diversity, uh, especially amongst vulnerable groups, then we need to increase our conversations with SMEs. SMEs are the ones who um, engage most with consumers. They influence to a large extent what um, caregivers purchase when they go to the market. They are the ones who in some local communities provide that last mile service of actually bringing foods to your doorstep. Uh, the, the, the rural women who hawk foods on their heads, who bring those, those products to the houses for, for women who are unable to go out into the marketplace. They control, at the end of the day, what the consumer actually consumes at the end of the day. So their role is really critical. Um, they uh, see themselves as being nibble because they are small. Uh, they're not like the larger companies who take time to make decisions. And so they are quick to adapt to um, consumer choices and consumer demands. And so if we 
if we are able to empower SMEs with the right information um, on what consumers should be, con should be eating, what is best suited for different um, vulnerable groups or target groups, then we will be bridging a wide gap in ensuring that um, people consume what, we, we, what they should be consuming, improving the nutritional, nutrition that really gets to the plate of the consumer at the end of the day. Now, um, the DG talked about farmers being the real SMEs or the larger proportion of SMEs. And I totally agree, especially in low and middle income um, countries. And in, in most conversations about nutrition, the farmers are left out. Where you have uh, policymakers, uh, development partners sitting around the table to talk about uh, dietary diversity, um, obesity um, um, statistics, we don't have those who are producing these foods at those tables. And this is something that we really need to work towards changing. Um, if we're talking about critical challenges that SMEs face, um, just having conversations with SMEs uh, prior to COVID, during the COVID situation, um, now that we're in COVID situation, and even as they try to uh, rebuild themselves as lockdowns are being eased, we, we consistently see some things come up. Um, access to finance is one of, one of those. Um, SMEs find it really difficult to access the financial support that they require to bring some of their, their business ideas to scale. We also see access to technical assistance as, as a huge challenge. There's a lot going on, um, so many development partners trying to see how they can secure technical um, assistance to SMEs, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. Um, and so uh, these are areas where we really need to focus. Uh, I, I, would, I would say a third area would be um, the policy environment. Most often, uh, national policies do not favor SMEs. Um, they find it difficult to access uh, government instruments that are made available, uh, let's say financial supports, because they do not meet some criteria. It could be in, in having the right collateral to be able to access those instruments. And so at the end of the day, those instruments are not accessible to them. Um, you have trade policies as well that do not favor SMEs, especially where governments are making um, a lot of um, uh, public declarations about trying to build homegrown markets. And then um, imports are not allowing businesses in the country to be, to be able to develop to, um, to support the market. And so uh, these are my ideas at this time, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Uduak. Really clear. Um, locally produced, locally sourced raw materials, influencing um, what consumers buy, nimble in, your, in the response, uh, including smallholders, and the challenges are around finance, the missing middle, technical assistance, and, and policy voice. The, because SMEs are small, how do they collectivize and get a, get a unified voice that uh, makes policymakers pay attention to them. So thank you very much, Uduak. Uh, Theo, um, we've, we've nicely set this up for you, uh, all of us. We've talked about how important smallholder farmers are. Uh, they're, they're a key part of the food system. What do your, member, what do your members, Theo, what do they think about, how do they relate to the idea of healthy diets? And, and how can your, your members be connected better to the rest of the food value chain to make, to make them uh, more resilient to shocks and to to generally strengthen livelihoods. Tara, over to you. Thank you so much for that. We really appreciate this opportunity. Both Lawrence and Director General Gu uh, Donggu, we we always appreciate it to, to to be part of the discussion on this and to be very frank and honest. In your first question, it was actually until very recently, not that much in the mind of farmers, um, uh, how nutritious is the food we produce. It is, uh, it is because of discussions like these. It's because of the work of an organization like GAIN or the work that Dr. David Nabaru has done in, in, in the um, food systems dialogues that farmers 
awareness of the health part of the food chain has been raised. And it, it, it loosened up a brand new energy in these debates. You see, farmers are consumers too. Very few farmers produce everything they, they consume or consume everything they produce. You are part of a much bigger system, a value chain that ends up with the consumer. And I really appreciate the, the business side of this debate on business strategies for the delivery of healthy diets. Because you see, as the Director General said, a farm is a business. And all the rules for a business apply. It needs to be profitable. If it's not profitable, it's a welfare case. It needs to be sustainable. You need to make that profit again next year and the year after. You need to be able to put the preferred product on the shelf for the consumer. And this is where the essence of this discussion comes in for me. Because there, there, there is those consumers, there are those consumers, especially in the global north, in Europe, in North America, where the consumer will choose the product of which they have clear answers to questions such as, how was this food produced? What practices were applied? What was the footprint of this production process on the environment? How did it impact on biodiversity and on the climate? Did it adhere to global standards? And that's expensive food. It's a more expensive process to get that food on the shelves. And unfortunately, that part of the market is still too small. Too few consumers ask those questions because for a much larger part of the market, the, the real issue to determine competitiveness is whether they can afford a healthy mix on the plate. If it is available in their environment, if they have access to it, that's the middle class. And we are really trying hard in our nick of the woods in Africa to grow that part of the market. But these were way too big part of the market for whom even that is beyond their reach. And competitiveness is simply, what can I have for dinner tonight? What can I serve my family? It's still a battle against the wolf of hunger. And with hunger goes the malnutrition part. And the profitability and the sustainability of those small holders, to which the Director General also referred to, is, is very shaky. It, it takes one hailstorm, one fire, one heat wave to take out their business. And, and COVID brought a whole new dimension to this. It is as if all of a sudden we are back to square one in the way we think about food, which for us as farmers, is really a good thing. How much of what you have on your plate left the farm gate in that format? If you think of it, really very little. There's a lot of processing in the downstream value chain. There's a lot of value add. And even something as simple as uh, uh, vegetables, uh, we, we have families who say for the first time now we know what a pumpkin looks like because when we buy it from the shelves and shops, it's already been cut and packaged if it's not been cooked. All of a sudden, people under lockdown started to ask all the important questions about our food systems. And there's a new awareness of the role of producers, not only in our economy, but also in society, there's a better connection now. It is as if people became aware that milk does not come from shelves and shops. There's something behind that. And then for us as farmers, it is very important when we rethink now life 
with COVID and we dare to dream about life after it. What must change to ensure that we have a benefit on both sides, both as producers, but also with consumers? Because the, the sharpest edge of this question about business strategies for the delivery of healthy diets on a healthy planet comes home to your smaller farmers. They are the most vulnerable. They are often the most food insecure. They are often those who are more delivered than anyone else to unhealthy diets. Um, and if we can cover the interests of that group, of the poorest, the weakest, the smallest, the most vulnerable, then we can cover the interest of all the rest. This is not a question only to farmers. We must be part of the discussion on it. But this is as much a question to the rest of the value chain in agriculture, but also to the scientists, the nutritionists. This is the kind of question which will determine whether there is a proper life for all of us and not only as humans, for the rest of the planet in future. And that's why it is so important that in the run-up to the Food System Summit of next year, we must formulate exactly, if, if, if I dare call it that, in, in simple farmer's language, we, we must formulate in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now, what do we want from our food systems? What do we need to change to ensure that a world without hunger and the world where our nutritional needs are covered, um, that, that, that those systems are being put in place? And if COVID did nothing else. It actually opened the door to such a future. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Um, great. I, I, I've heard you speak a few times now, and I'm always, I always learn something new, and I'm always uh, moved by your, your passion. Um, you see, you, the things that, you, that resonated with me, you said, you know, you were really honest. You said, well, until recently, uh, smallholder farmers have got enough to worry about uh, just surviving rather than thinking about healthy diets. Um, but but the potential is there because they are also consumers as well as producers. Uh, they're also businesses and businesses respond to consumer preferences. And if consumers can't afford to buy healthier food or they're, or they're not plugged into the, uh, the need to do so or it's not available, then farmers don't have, can't do much about that. Uh, and then you talked about how the lockdown is another spur to a sort of an awakening uh, of a wider group of people about where food comes from. And it doesn't sort of magically appear on the shelves. It's, it's, it starts in a field somewhere. Um, and I think that's been really important. And I think, I think you also said um, we need to, you know, farmers, farmers face the same risks pretty much everyone else does. In, along the value chain, um, but they have perhaps uh, a smaller ability to mitigate that risk. Uh, it seems to me they're more they're more bound by the by nature's risks than other other actors in the value chain who can source from different areas and and, uh, and mitigate and diversify more easily than smallholder farmers. So thank you for giving us that vivid uh, in, a set of insights from all three panelists. And I think we're about on time, and the floor is open. We have about 20, 25 minutes for Q&A. And uh, I'll try to uh, read out the questions. And if there's a flood of them, I'll try to pick them out or cluster them to make sure you get a good representation. And, uh, and, and if I can ask you guys to be brief in your responses, and I'll, I'll try to cluster them uh, two or three at a time. So floor is open. Questions, please. And if I don't see any in the chat box, um, please just unmute yourself and feel free to jump in. But all I ask is that you keep your questions brief and your answers brief. Floor is open. Everyone's being super shy or they're, they're uh, typing really slowly. Well, 
I'm going to ask Diane a question because um, she there's one there's one there was one bit of her uh, one part of her comments that I wasn't too clear on Diane, and that was really what what do what do businesses need from you know governments, and what do they need from other stake civil society? What do they need from the research community? What did they, 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 have a, they have a leadership role, but they, we know none of us can do this on our own. What do they need? Absolutely. Thanks, Lawrence, for allowing me to build on that point further. And I think this type of forum where we're bringing this variety of stakeholders together that you and the FAO team have done so well is a big part of what we need because we need to build trust and we need to build understanding. But of course, there's work that needs to be done both sides to support that trust building. There are many businesses, large and small, including through to the farmers, and Theo, I'm so grateful that you always, and Uruak, you did a great job with that too, include them as part of our business sector for this, that are always going to lead and work and evolve and develop their portfolios and evolve their practices. But there are some businesses for whom regulation is going to be required. And that's what allows a real consistent response to the needs. So we do need policy leaders to clarify uh, what, the, what absolutely must be achieved. That helps everybody. But there's also this aspect of consistent policy across uh, sectors of government. We don't have really almost anywhere in the world what I would call food policy. We have agricultural policy, economic policy, development policy, and ministers of all of these different areas of government. And if we can come together across these ministries to really put together clarity on what the food um, policy guidance can be at a country level that ladders up to the type of global ambition that we know all of us here are working towards setting out. That helps everybody all steer in the same direction. So these are just a couple of examples, but together in partnership through these types of events and the, and the work that we do together building to and through and from this will really help us go miles faster, farther. Okay, thank you, Diane. And um, I hear what you're saying level playing field um, and you know very few countries i think maybe one or two have a national food system action plan and i think where you know, all the different departments get joined up and send send a consistent set of coherent signals to everybody else not just businesses but to everybody else and we've got a couple of questions um, um, we've got a question from nicole metz uh, you know what would we uh, and this is to the whole panel or anyone on the panel would like to pick it up really um, we can we talk about uh, internalizing externalities you know the, the food choices people make in consumption and production have negative consequences for the environment and negative consequences for health but if we internalize those and made those who generate those externalities pay for them they would inevitably pass those on to consumers and so food prices will go up what what do the what are the, any of the panelists like to reflect on that? That's the first question. Um, we have a question from Anna Lati about next year is the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables. Uh, fruits and vegetables are produced by women, not so much by men. How can women farmers be supported? Uh, the next question. So that's the second question. The third question is from Rose uh, Mutuku. Um, Smart Logistics, Roses from Smart Logistics in Kenya. Question is for Uduak. What can SMEs do better to get governments and financial institutions to respond to their need? And um, kind of a similar question from Steve Bartholomew's from uh, Food Industry Asia to Uduak. Again, given the nature of COVID, uh, the impact on SMEs, what can SBN do um, and what can, what can big companies do to support SMEs? I think I'll stop there. So panelists, over to you. Please keep your responses brief and just jump in, whoever wants to take that. Maybe we start with Uduak. There are a couple of questions for you. Sure, thank you, Lawrence. Um, so let me address the what what can SMEs do better to get governments and financial institutions to respond to their needs? 
So in, in our interactions with these various players, with, um, with, with SMEs, with, with governments, and with financial institutions, a couple of things have come out um, quite strongly. The financial institutions feel that um, SMEs are um, risky. Um, and so investing in SMEs, sometimes investors find the risk is too high. Um, and sometimes even where um, there is some level of um, interest in, in investing in SMEs, SMEs are not uh, investable or investment ready. So it is critical to ensure that um, SMEs are empowered with the, the right knowledge uh, and capacity to make themselves investable. Uh, we find in, in, in many circumstances where um, books are not in order, um, taxes have not been paid, uh, they are not complying to standards and regulations as they should be. And so SMEs need to ensure that they have played their own role in putting themselves in, in a position to be attractive for investment. And then you, you can't be a lone voice in the wilderness. You need to be part of, of, of a movement. And so SMEs need, to, SMEs need to be able to better organize themselves, to be able to put forward um, their interest and, and their, their challenges either to government or to uh, financial institutions and find the right partnerships that can help them to be able to drive the change that they're looking to achieve. So that's, that's, that's what I think SMEs can do better to get government and financial institutions to respond better to their needs. You have to be, to be part of something that is larger than yourself. You need to be part of a movement and all of you need to be working towards the common goal to, to, um, to drive the change and the interest that you're looking for. Now to, to Bartholomew's question on um, COVID response. Yes, uh, the Sun Business Network, Network did undertake a rapid survey of, of SMEs across um, Sun countries. Uh, we have been able to surface how badly they have been impacted by COVID-19. Um, we are currently in the process of um, implementing some, um, some strategies to support these SMEs. We have been able to present this survey to, um, to the donor community and to some of our partners to be able to um, get some interest in financial support, um, technical assistance support for businesses that are operating, uh, some SMEs that are operating in, in some of these countries. Um, we are um, using the information from our service to develop what we call options papers that we can take to uh, financial institutions, uh, multinational members of the Sun Business Network to be able to um, identify different um, interventions that they can support with to help the SMEs to weather this, this storm. Uh, we have interest from some of our large um, multinational members in providing uh, support as far as um, capacity building in areas such as digitalizing uh, business operations to ensure that SMEs continue to thrive in, in this new environment where uh, physical business transactions is getting more and more difficult. So I hope that that's, thank um, I've been able to address this question. Thank you, Uruak. Thank you very much. Um, we have, um, would Emily, would you like to uh, answer that question, Emily Grady uh, on WBCSD on the true cost of food? Actually, it was me approaching you, Lawrence, but Emily can equally uh, jump in. We are okay. three people from the BBC here. Um, Emily whoever, can build in on that. Whoever sure. would like I think to it was, answer it. Uh, it was a really interesting question from one of the, of the participants on whether the true pricing of food would help make more sustainable and healthy diets uh, affordable? It's a very fundamental question. Um, we like to use the expression true value of food rather than true pricing, by the way, because uh, indeed reflecting the, the real value of what we are eating is the most important. And that means reflecting the negative, but also the positive externalities. There is a need to really reshuffle our policy model um, the way the subsidies are distributed and the way many other policy uh, mechanisms are attributed so that the food that is produced in a more healthy and sustainable way is actually cheaper than what it is right now. And conversely, the one that actually damages more the environment or contributes to more health issues would be more expensive. 
So I leave it to that, but that's for us indeed really an extremely important piece of the puzzle for the governments to uh, step in. Okay, thank you. Is anyone, any one of the panelists like to make a quick comment before we go to the next round of questions? There's some questions from Theo coming up. Uh, and Perhaps if I can just jump yep, in quickly, ahead. Lawrence, I think as Emmeline was just adding, this work to internalize those externalities to get to the true value of how companies are performing is really important and we would welcome others to work with us in that. There's a big partnership effort underway in that. But I noticed there was a question there also about the role of gender and I think this is something that we need to pay very close attention to. Women are by far the largest workers across the value chain from farm all the way to store and are often most, well, almost always not equally compensated or engaged in the financial systems and mechanisms. And this is something, getting the equity of finance to flow fairly across the value chain, particularly as we see in COVID, is going to be really important. And we're working with the finance sector on this, but it goes beyond just the finance sector. We have to represent these contributions in each portion of the value chain equally and redistribute what that value looks like. That's also part of getting to the true value of food. And we have to be very careful. Theo, I'm going to channel you here. This, we cannot drive cost and burden to the farmers in doing this. It has to be an enabler in support of them with their practices. So there is a lot that we're working to shift across this uh, getting finance to flow fairly and providing equitable value at each point. And gender has a significant role to play in that as well. So something that we're all needing to pay more cl close attention to. Thanks, Diane. Thanks for reminding me not to forget that. Um, Teo, I've got a couple of questions for you. One from Florence, and I think one from Mercy uh, Langajo, Florence Tartignac and Mercy Langajo. One, one is on the cost. We're asking uh, smallholder farmers to engage in all these new concerns, uh, healthy diets, uh, climate smart agriculture. Uh, how, do they, how do they do that? And who, who covers the cost of their engagement? That, that takes time away from their, their core businesses. Or, or do we not think about it that way? And the other question for you, Teo, is around consumer associations. Um, what, what role do consumer associations play in shaping uh, what, your, what your members do plant and don't plant and how they how they market their food over to you thank you lawrence uh, it's extremely important questions these um the, the the first answer is 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 really the the simplest one and that is that in the current current paradigm of smallholder farming we very often work into a poverty trap. It is not fair to expect from a smallholder farmer to compete on the open market with the best other farmers in the world. Whilst in the immediate environment, and, and, and no smallholder lives in a silo, you, you, you live usually in the deep rural areas, where there are issues with infrastructure, with linkages to markets, with the availability of health and education facilities and these. And, and, and the smallholders cannot do much about that. It, it's governments that must create that environment, both the physical and the economical environment, the policy environment, which is conducive to profitable farming. Well, the first question that was asked in, in our discussion today was what do we expect from governments? And, and I think there is no more important thing we can ask from governments than to create that policy environment in which smallholders can thrive. Because if they can thrive, all the rest will also thrive. You should carry the cost of it. Well, it's, it, it is important that governments plan for this. It's about rural and economical development. It's about creating wealth. Because there's only one way to uh, chop off the head of the dragon of, of poverty, and, and that's by creating wealth. 
the, 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 the second question about the role of consumers associations, it is actually um, the, 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 the key question on change of behavior, change of production systems, not only what we produce, but how we produce it. It's got everything to do with the producer. That is the reason why we speak of value chains in agriculture, because you cannot push a chain. You can only pull it. And the pulling force is the market. Farmers will always produce what the de market demand from them, what the market will pay for. And if they ask for something different, farmers cannot continue to do what they've always done before. You see, food security in the new world, in, 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 in the modern paradigm, will always mean that you need to produce more of that in which you have a competitive advantage so that you can exchange from the food basket that which you do not have a competitive advantage in. Europe will never produce its own bananas. And if you need bananas in your diet, you need to have open trade. And you have to trade that in which you, which you can produce um, competitively. And global trade's role in securing food security is really um, underestimated in these debates. But it is such a, such a sensitive issue. The moment you move there, everybody's hair is um, standing straight up on, on, on the heads and everybody's talking about the leveling of playing fields. And, and it seems as if no one wants to go there. But, but the modern world cannot have food security if we do not address the issue of how do we move food from where it can competitively be produced to where it cannot. And, and it is in these negotiations that I feel um, the, the business dimension of agriculture is neglected. We need a trade dispensation which is fair and equitable to the smallest and the weakest. Thank you, Theo. Um, thank you. So I've got some more questions and I'm going to summarize them. And panelists, note them down and decide which ones you want to respond to. And this is really the last round of questions and I'll, I'll give you about six or seven questions. So Siobhan Kelly said, how do we, basically, how do we, how do we build the demand for healthy food? It follows up from your comment now, Theo, about consumers are important. But do we just wait around for consumers to develop their preference for healthy food or can we do something to shift consumption? Uh, Stefano uh, Preto, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, says SMEs are great. And forgive me for paraphrasing your questions. SMEs are great, but how do we how do we get scale with SMEs? And Stefano also has a question, which I think is for all the panel, but especially maybe for Diane. It's it. How ready really are uh, virtuous companies? How really how ready are they really for uh, government regulation that is inconvenient for them? Um, Bibi uh, has talked about uh, youth. No one's mentioned youth. I think that's very important for, for farming. How do we make farming attractive to youth? I mean, my answer would be make it profitable, but I'm sure it's much, much more complex than that. Uh, Mercy Langaho asked a really good question about in times of crisis and shocks, such as COVID-19, that's, that's affecting businesses, especially small businesses, there are no safety nets for small businesses. So, so small businesses have to and I think Mercy said, collaborate rather than compete. What are some of those collaboration mechanisms? And then a really important question from Solal Lehek, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your, your name, which is, you know, all the things we're talking about, there'll be some winners and some losers. And, and this, we're talking about a transition from one set of food systems to another. There will be winners and there will be losers. Who are those losers likely to be? Obviously, it's very context specific, but what can we say about generally about losing groups and what can we do to, to mitigate and make the transition easier for them? Sorry for those who put in questions, but I couldn't summarize it uh, well enough. Um, panelists, this is your last chance at making an intervention. Please make it brief. Over to you in whatever order you want. I'm happy to go first. 
Um, so, yeah, because I read through the chat and I also saw a couple of questions and I wrote a couple of them down. Um, let me talk about consumer demand. Uh, I've always viewed consumer demand as uh, something that requires collective effort. It's not something that the private, in some cases, not not in some cases, it's not always something that the, the SMEs can do or businesses can do on their own, especially SMEs because they, they don't often have the bandwidth for it. Um, there was a question about um, how do you, how do we um, get uh, things like fresh fruits and vegetables to be um, demanded by, by consumers. I, I think that they, there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, in being able to collaborate um, and provide consumers with, this, with the same message. The, me the same message needs to come from um, the, the health system. The same message needs to come from the food system. It needs to be the same message from um, the policymakers as far as consumption of these foods are concerned. Uh, we need to be able to identify and utilize influencers within our communities. It could be um, youth influencers. It could be social impact influencers to be able to encourage people to eat the foods that we want them to eat. Eat. We need to understand what um, influences how the consumer um, makes their, their choices and, and put in measures within that system to be able to influence those choices. So it, it requires collective effort. Uh, on, the, on the business side, there needs to be a lot more collaboration. Um, very often, these foods may not look attractive in silos. And so uh, the person who is selling vegetables needs to identify which other product could complement those vegetables to ensure that it becomes more appealing. Um, case in point, you will not, in, in, on most packages of um, starchy, um, flour-based foods in, in this part of Africa, when you see the picture on the packaging, it's put beside a rich plate of vegetables with some animal sauce protein on it. That's a collaborative way of, of um, promoting different foods all in one place. So there needs to be some level of collaboration and partnership in um, communicating um, desirability of these various products to the consumer. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stop you there, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> running a bit late, sorry. Um, That's fine. Teo. Any pick some questions you'd like, but be brief, please. If, if, if I can address two other issues, the one is on, on youth and women. Uh, our, our big challenge and, and one of our key projects in World Farmers Organization is actually to ensure that we recruit the brightest young minds to choose agriculture as a career. And they will only do that if it, if it can be profitable. No one will choose poverty. Um, and, and as for women, you know, the, the, the most important task of any farmer's organization is to influence policy, to, to do advocacy. And I'm very proud to say that at this stage, we have no less than 22 national farmer's organizations who are led by women. Women forcefully step forward in advocacy in our food systems and especially in primary production like never before in, in our history. And they are doing a marvelous job at it. I think the age of women in agriculture has dawned. Um, uh, about the, the, the question uh, on, on winners and losers and who will be the winners and who will be the losers. I think fortunately that it has not been determined yet, but, but we just need to continue on the, the, the current path and family farmers might be the biggest losers. We really need a big push to ensure the future of the family farmer as an anchor of rural economies. This is why it's so extremely important that we all take part in this decade of family of the fam family farmer as we've launched at FAO last year. Thank you, Theo. And I think I think it's you know, one could say it's quite cynical to think of winners and losers, but I, I don't think it's cynical. I don't think it's a zero sum thing because, you know, change only change doesn't happen because it's against some people's interests to change. So there will definitely be uh, some losers. And I think we just have to think politically about who those groups are going to be and figure out ways to either unblock that or, or soften the, the consequences 
Um, so not an easy one, but a good question to be raised and something to be mindful of over the next three days. Diane. Thanks, Lawrence. I will respond to the question on, are companies really doing this work? And the answer is yes. There are companies who already have made significant shifts to the ingredients in their portfolios, have made significant additions to the types of food offerings and food and products that they are serving, and who've made some pretty dramatic changes in their sourcing strategies with longer term contracts, smallholder engagement mechanisms, and diversification of ingredients that benefit farmer finance as well. So the answer is yes, it's happening. There's more um, that can, needs to can, be done. Can I interrupt you for a sec? Yes. What, what, what from WBCSD's experience, what, what distinct, why, why do some companies take a leadership role and others not? I mean, is there any, are there any common factors that you can discern? Common drivers? Yeah, that's a great question, Lawrence. I Don't see have to answer often, it now. No, let me, let, just very quickly, no. I see often it starts with leadership at the top, like, like in any organization, but it also comes from the passionate and committed employees. These are usually big groundswell efforts that we see from folks who are involved in the work, choosing to put these priorities forward in what they are working on. But I will also say there's a big consumer pull, and we're seeing this across all markets. There's an awareness and growth for what people are choosing to eat. The adventurous eating that was happening across many, many markets prior to COVID, and then the response to having to cook from home and has changed many people's views. This consumer demand puts pressure into the food system. So where we had leading companies seeing differentiated opportunities for sales and growth and security of supply and risk mitigation, both sides of that coin, we're seeing more movement now than ever before. And, and perhaps, Lawrence, I'll just close on that consumer piece. You know, we're, we're both doing a lot of work in this space. And I think one of the most exciting areas of work is actually the Demand Generation Alliance that Gain's been leading. There's some real engaging opportunity to figure out how we shift behaviors towards healthier outcomes to further put pressure onto that demand signal so that actually many more companies are driving faster on this. But with that, I'm conscious of time and I'll turn yeah. it back over to you, Lawrence. Huge thanks for including me. It was a great honor to be with this panel today. Um, thank you, panel. I was great. I learned a lot, uh, was engaged completely. And uh, I thank you, thank you uh, audience participants for really great questions. You didn't pull your punches and they were, I'm glad I didn't have to answer some of those questions. They were difficult. Um, so great discussion, great presentations. Um, Marcella. Um, I'm turning over to you now for some reflections. We're five minutes late. I apologize. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Lawrence. And indeed, I fully agree with you. It's been a fascinating panel and lots and lots of, uh, of uh, advancement in terms of uh, how we're addressing this, our panel on business strategies on the delivery of healthy diets for a healthy planet. So combining the role of the private sector with health outcomes, nutrition outcomes, and also the planet sustainability. So all of that in one food system, well, it's not all that easy to address. But we start with who is this, who is this private sector? Who are we talking about? And the DG reminds us, it's farmers. It's uh, the first group of private sector is the farmers. Uh, private sector is dominated, but not only the farmers, the family farmers, as Theo also underlined several times. So farmers struggle, especially smallholders, continuously with their profitability and sustainability. Not only the sustainability of the planet, their own sustainability too. And as Thea reminded us, this issue of producing for a healthy diet, for nutrition, is new for many farmers. There's awareness that is starting to gel uh, from that perspective. But of course, farmers are at the same time producer and consumers. So clearly, uh, that uh, angle is coming in very, very strongly, although they are in a very shaky situation already to start with, and that was even before COVID. We discussed uh, quite a bit about affordability. So yes, push for healthy diets, uh, but how affordable are they? We heard also the sobering figure that uh, 3 billion people uh, in the world today cannot afford uh, healthy diets fruits and vegetables, and as Anna reminded us, we're having the year, International Year of Fruits and Vegetables next year. 
but who can really afford the fresh fruits and vegetables that is so necessary for a healthy diet. So who's going to take the bill of this affordability? Are we just going to pass it on to the smallholder? Are we going to pass it to the producer? Who's going to pay for this? Very complicated equation of balancing out. It's an act of balancing out the affordability issues, the sustainability, the health, the nutrition, and of course, within all of that, the survival of the farmers themselves, which is not given for granted at all. So of course, the SMEs play, play a critical role. Um, critical role, of course, we, uh, we, we strongly uh, understand how critical this uh, role is. And uh, we were reminded by Urual how uh, they're the ones who most engage the consumers. Uh, so they are actually the ones who actually control most of what people eat around, uh, around the world. And they also provide a lot of mile, uh, services. But at the same time, they are the ones who have probably less knowledge about the health issues, the health dimensions. So their role is critical, but they need to be much more empowered with knowledge. Now they need many other things. Um, as we were reminded, uh, access to finance, those technical assistance, uh, but very importantly, policy voice. Uh, they fundamentally need a set of policies that will allow them to fare better within all of this balancing act, but they need to be supported and they need, need to be sustained. They need to be investable. I like that term, uh, that term. So policy voice, uh, but in order for them to have that police voice, there, there needs to be work in terms of supporting their organizations. And as Theo would have reminded us had he had the time, yes, within the global action plan for the decade of family farming, supporting organizations and farmers organizations is one of the pillars, one of the seven pillars is about how those organizations are going to be uh, supported in an, in an effective way. So how are we going to ensure that there's much more in terms of collaboration, organization, and less in terms of competition, more in terms of empowerment, technological empowerment, among other forms of empowerment. Now, at the same time, we are calling for a stronger role of the government. We're talking that SMEs, farmers need a better, stronger policy voice. And on the other side, we want the governments to come in much, much, much stronger in terms of a good system of incentives and disincentives, and the incentives towards healthy diets. Disincentives against, of course, unhealthy diets. How do you balance that? And Lawrence reminds us, remind um, all governments included on the positive business returns of healthy employees, very positive bus uh, business uh, returns there. And we need to do much more, including through the governments, including through the system of incentives, but not only, to create a higher demand for healthy diets. And we discussed a little bit of how, um, how to do that. The role of the companies, of course, uh, very importantly, we already have companies and big companies who are very much engaging and who have already operated shifts in terms of what they're doing towards more healthy diets, towards more sustainability towards more engagement of the family farmers. And uh, there, we do have a uh, responsible business pledge for improved nutrition, it's very important. And I hope that many, many, many companies are going to um, adhere uh, to that. So it's about leveraging pressure points and how we're going to uh, be able to do that fairly and equitably, of course. And equitably, when we talk about equality, uh, we see we are, are in the middle of a pandemic that has reminded us how much inequality there is around the world, but not only that, how strong the structural inequality of our societies is producing the health outcomes and also is producing uh, the um, income uh, outcomes. But underlying in our societies, we have massive and sometimes hidden structural inequalities, and yes, one of them is gender, that was also brought up uh, very uh, importantly, how fundamental it is to address gender inequalities. We also talked about youth, and that's going to be the future. 
But if we don't address the structural inequalities that we have in front of us in the agricultural sector, um, that basically is built many way, in many ways on those gender inequalities. When are we going to have healthier diets? When are we going to have a more sustainable production if we don't look at these structural inequalities? And yes, uh, Lawrence uh, reminded us at the beginning that uh, we are uh, seeing statues come down. Very uh, interesting moment we are in the world uh, moment. It's a pandemia, a pandemic, and at the same time, we're really rethinking uh, how we are as societies. Statues are coming down after centuries. And my final question is, how many more centuries until the gender inequalities are adequately addressed for us to be able to have a fairer, more equitable world that is also producing in a more healthy way that addresses nutrition and that addresses uh, sustainability at the same time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marcella. Um, I, before I turn, back to, turn it over to Steve, I just wanted to pick up on something you said. Uh, you know, you said we're, we're trying to move forward on multiple fronts here, and that's going to be a challenge. But you, you rightly said let, we're up for the challenge. And I just want to remind us all that we, when we talk about protecting and respecting and fulfilling rights, we don't pick and choose the rights. We fulfill, protect, and respect. We, we focus on civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights, and we view them as indivisible. And I think we need to start thinking about the outcomes from food systems in the same way as indivisible. Yes, there will be trade-offs sometimes, but we can't pick and choose which ones we advance. We have to advance them all at the same time. There may be some sequencing, there may be some prioritization work, but we have to think about them all at the same time. And I know working together, we can do that. Steve, we're yeah. a bit over time, over to you. No, we're gonna make, make this up. So Marcella, thanks for a, a very elegant distillation and also suitably challenging finish to that. You and Lawrence are going to close today. I'm looking at the timetable. We're now going to move to the two breakouts. I think we should give the breakouts an extra 10 minutes. So um, those are going to be led by Siobhan Kelly and Pilar Santa Coloma from FAO. So I would suggest that you go to 3.10, not at three o'clock, so we make up a few minutes. And then uh, you will both as chairs of those sessions need to give us very quick feedbacks of the outputs from those two sessions. And then uh, I think Marcel and Lance, you won't need 15 minutes to close the day. So I think if we push the timing back a little bit, that will be better. So um, as if by magic now, you will all be put into one of the two rooms. Most of you chose those rooms. If you didn't, you're being um, kind of, uh, sort of selected to go where we think you need to go. So you cannot protest because you did not choose. So um, now we'll ask the two co-chairs to um, convene their sessions and everyone will magically move to one or the other. And we'll reconvene as a group as a, a, a 10 past a three, a 10 past four Rome time, no, 10 past, well, 10 past the hour, thank you.
I see Takuya and Hope that now rejoined the, the webinar. Uh, please bear in mind that now there are two breakout sessions going on. Uh, I'm asking you if uh, you want to be placed in any of the two rooms. Uh, I just sent you some private messages.
Um, welcome back, everybody. I think um, we're still waiting for one of the second groups to arrive. So we'll just wait for one or two minutes. Uh, Steve, well, I've got you here. Yeah. When we uh, so again, and I think Thou have prepared background documents for each one of these. Yes. Today. When will they be available? Oh, they are available. I think they've been sent out to all participants. Yeah. Already. Okay. And we can post the linkages maybe tomorrow, so everyone can access them. Publicly um, available tomorrow, or yes, yes, I think so. Okay. okay great. So I think we're just gradually knocking up the number here. Um, Siobhan, I think you're already on this call. I don't know whether Pilar's there yet, but um, if you can, I think we need to really, we'll do the proper reporting from that session. I think because of um, taking the extra time for the groups, which was sensible, and bearing in mind, we still have to close. I think if you could just really couple of minutes on the main areas that were covered by the, um, the breakout group. I know that's quite difficult to do at, at short notice, but I don't think we really have too much time to report back. And then we can post written reports of the, um, of the session. So um, I don't know if um, Tob Tobias can tell me, are, are the others here yet? I think we just need to close them down and get them here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I don't know about the other group. Siobhan here. Yeah. So our, our group came back timely. <laughs> we came back on time late, but planned late. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're present and correct, Steve. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we get our brownie points or our scouts points or whatever they're called. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So. But we really could have done it another hour, actually. We were just getting into, the, uh, into it. So yeah. well, next time. We're, we're, we're the victims of ambition, you know. Yeah. We try too much to cover too much. Um, well, I mean, we could start, but it's pretty pointless debriefing ourselves. Um, they're coming back now, Steve. Okay, they're coming. Uh, yeah, there we are. We're in. Okay, so um, I think in the interest of time, Pilar, can you prepare to do a very truncated or shortened report from your group? And Siobhan will, will be the trailblazer by summarizing their discussion in two minutes. And then... I misspoke, we'll go to the closing, which will be uh, Beth Bechtel, who's the Deputy Director General of, of FAO, will make some closing comments with, with Lawrence, and we have only 10 minutes. So Siobhan, just a, a brief taster of what you covered. Uh, two minutes, please. Okay, well, we had really an amazing panel, and, um, and, and I think it was the makeup of that panel. We had Catherine, who's the owner of um, Eden Grow, which is a fruit and vegetable, um, packaging um, enterprise in Ghana. We had Tobias representing the retail sector. We had Stephen representing the business association and Mary coming in with that, that global um, thought piece. And so uh, there were lots of questions there for the panel, but we focused on uh, B2B and the discussion evolved um, from B2B, thinking about B2B, business to business in terms of the value chain locking linearly. And so Catherine gave us some of the challenges that she faces, typically access to data, access to technology, access to finance, and how the access to those, um, to those components would uh, propel and, and help her grow her business model. Um, but she's a small enterprise and uh, within that space, there's a lot of um, competitors. And so then moving on to the business association, we heard about how bringing together um, businesses, particularly small businesses within that small space um, and um, in that pre-competitive space can help address 
those issues that so many companies um, um, deal with. And we heard about, for instance, the Food Accelerator Program and the coming together of 260 SMEs, SMEs that deal with dried fruit, and listening for the first time about data that talks about a 15 and market data that talks about consumers wanting 15% of consumers wanting a decrease in sugar. And then we, we heard from Tobias as well about the Sugar Out Initiative and about how companies and industry there have come together and um, looked at how they can explore how to make healthier products with less um, sugar in order to respond to this growing market for um, healthier products. And then Mary talked to us about this concept of co-opetition and how companies need to come together um, and co-opt, maybe compete on the supermarket shelves, but in order for that to work, it needs the support of the public sector. It needs the support of organizations such as FAO to really take this scale. And, and she used the example of Ireland's Origin Green, which really brings in um, the whole, all of, of the stakeholders. So that was really an issue that was reinforced, this idea of competition amongst the private sector, but then it needs to be um, cushioned no, by uh, the public sector coming around. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, two minutes, thank you. Yeah, Pilar. Yes, uh, we have also a very amazing panel. Uh, we have a representative from the cooperative, uh, Danilo Salerno, who explained what is the scope of the cooperative movement around the globe and what is the other value and they, uh, he emphasized very much on, on the issue of the entrepreneurial diversity or the cooperatives and, and the role in the local development as uh, one of the important uh, players in, the, in, in this, uh, at this level. Um, also, they are responding as a, as a movement uh, to, to the demands from uh, public procurement uh, in particular. Uh, from Gigi uh, Sahel Consulting, uh, there was very interesting insights on the what are the kind of, of elements needed to support SMEs and education came at first. Uh, very important to teach uh, agribusiness uh, to the SMEs, uh, made, made them knowledgeable, uh, focus on, on, on issues related to nutrition and healthy, um, and make them um, like uh, uh, package, package, packing themselves as a as a, a bankable or um, um, investable. What the the world say before uh, people? So they need really to have, to be uh, pre better prepared to to be uh, uh, to be part in, in the formality sector in the financial sector. Also the, the issue of the having strong regulations and establish clear rules, that is a, the role that was uh, envisaged for the, mostly for the um, public sector, um, but also very much associated to uh, education. And then the, we, we hear also about how the uh, how they form a, a SME uh, from being a, a family farmers to, to provide a service provision from Tatiana Mata from Mozambique. Um, and also she also um, emphasized on, on the need to support uh, SMEs uh, in terms of technical assistance and, and access to, to, I mean, mentoring or kind of a good agricultural practices for them to, to improve their the own business. From Incofin, we have a very interesting uh, proposal they are uh, working on uh, to provide investment to, and technical assistance together uh, to food systems in Africa. That is a joint proposal we gain. Um, so, um, so far, apparently, the the financial intermediary institutions are are, uh, pre are not um, very kind to to provide assistance to SMEs because the, precisely the, the lack of readiness of the SMEs. So there is the need of donor organizations or. or I'll sorry to interrupt. We're just so running against time, but that's brilliant. Yeah, is okay. that okay? 
It's fine. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, uh, yeah, I wanted now to really, we conclude uh, this first of the webinars. And I wanted to ask uh, Beth Bechtel, Beth, you're, you're not new to agriculture, but you're relatively new to FAO, and we're really delighted that you're there. And thanks so much for your support for the development of this policy dialogue. And maybe you'd like to offer us a few reflections on the discussions that you, you've had today. And then we will, I'll ask Lawrence just to close the, the session on behalf of us all. Beth. Sure, thank you, Steve. And thanks, Lawrence, for letting us be a part of this with you. It's been great to work alongside you and so many other great colleagues on this discussion. And I'm actually looking very forward to being a part of the next two days worth of discussions as well, which means that maybe, Steve, I don't have to try to encapsulate all of it uh, right now, given that we know we have two more days worth of outstanding conversations. I would just maybe wrap up today and, and say that for me, these dialogues uh, could not have taken place at a more appropriate time. And without recounting data and statistics, it really does sort of, I think, boil down to the fact that we do continue to have very alarming levels of global malnourishment uh, that need to be addressed. The SOFI has emphasized that to all of us once again. Second, the place that we find ourselves globally with the COVID pandemic means that, as we've all talked about, food systems transformation and making sure that all of the advancements we have made in global food and agriculture, uh, that we don't lose ground, that we continue to gain ground and we continue to build back better. I think also we're finding ourselves at a time where more than ever the private sector is aligning itself more and more with things like the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN's 2030 Agenda, and really coming to a place where they're working on that corporate sustainability mission-oriented uh, set of priorities. And so the time that we find ourselves in cannot be lost. There are too many positive, forward-looking, directional opportunities here for us to be able to capitalize on these opportunities to bring healthier diets and more sustainable agricultural transformation alongside the private sector. Uh, we are currently working on a new private sector engagement strategy at FAO. The Director General mentioned that. Uh, I am taking the lead uh, on that effort for us as an organization. And this kind of discussion and input is incredibly beneficial as we contemplate what comes next in that new strategy, even for FAO as, an, as a larger organization. Clearly, farmers are fundamental to our engagement with private sector. We know that the private sector will be playing a central role in both supporting healthy diets and also a healthy planet. And more than anything, I think today's session for me really emphasized the continued importance that needs to be put on uh, SMEs and, um, and not necessarily just traditional private sector partners, but obviously a very diverse group of partners that could bring, I think, great value. The last thing I would say, though, that is a bit of maybe a word of caution, and I think I heard it in one of the closing uh, sessions in the breakout panel, um, we really need to make sure that through these kinds of discussions, we do continue to speak candidly, that we continue to speak honestly, and that we work to build trust. Uh, as I have come from outside of the UN system, more or less from the private sector, into FAO in my new role, it's very clear that there have been what I would say decades of misalignment of mission and purpose, uh, perspective and direction. And more than ever for the kinds of goals that we are all working to achieve, a continued focus on building trust, genuine trust and an understanding of each other's different perspectives and the shared opportunities that we have together will be ever more important. And I think today is the start of many of those types of dialogues and I look forward to the next two days as well. Thanks very much. And Lawrence, I'll turn it over to you to close. Thank you, Beth. Um, thank you so much. Um, your words about trust really, you know, we can only go as fast as trust. Um, that, that seems to me pretty obvious. And how do you build trust? You have 
uh, aligned goals and you work together to develop those and realize those goals. And that seems to me that's how you build trust. And uh, it can be built. But you're right, we have to be careful because it can be lost very quickly. Um, it's, it's great to have you here. It's, it was really inspiring to have the, the DG open it and you uh, close it out. I, I heard, um, I am going to make a sort of a very brief attempt to encapsulate a few things I heard today. I heard that um, businesses, especially SMEs, including smallholder farmers, they really need three things. They, they need finance, they need technical assistance, and they need help from the policy settings. And, and we heard that there are things they can do. They can, businesses can get themselves investor ready. They can um, develop uh, mechanisms for communities of practice, if you like, to share technical assistance uh, with big companies, small companies providing that, that TA. And they can, they can organize to get a collective voice to policymakers to, to pay attention to them. Policymakers will listen to 500 SMEs but they won't listen to one SME. But what's really clear also, and it sets us up nicely for the next two days really, is that the system settings that businesses operate within are also really, really important. And it goes to the question of scale that I think Tobias raised in, in the, the small group that I was in. And it seems to me there are five mechanisms for scale and we need to, I think we're gonna to touch on many of them in the next two days. So first, first scaling mechanism is policy. You know, what is public procurement doing? If, if the government Ministry of Health is say, do, saying do this, but public procurement of food for schools, uh, prisons and hospitals is doing something else, that's a really mixed message and it's not a platform for businesses to, to build on. Finance, what's happening in finance? That's the second scaling mechanism. There's $200 billion in the impact investing um, sector right now. 18 billion of it goes to Africa. Of that 18 billion, 5 billion of it goes to food and agriculture. And of that 5 billion, 200 million goes to nutritious food. 200 million for 54 countries in Africa for nutritious food. That's 400 SMEs. That's, you know, that's a country. And the, the continent probably has 100,000 SMEs, maybe, maybe a million SMEs, probably more than a million. So, you know, finance is clearly lacking. Uh, consumer demand is the third scaling mechanism. Uh, somebody said it's a collective effort. Somebody today said it's a collective effort. It, and it's not always about health. You know, food, people, when people think of food, they don't automatically think of health. Even though food is the most important, uh, one, of the, one of the most important determinants of health, people think of food, they think of identity, they think of culture, they think of aspiration. We need to be really clever about building the demand for healthy foods. We can't leave it up to the private sector. We, it has to be public sector led with private sector smarts brought in. Fourth, uh, fourth scaling mechanism is investors. Investor coalitions, big institutional investors. We have ESG, environmental, social and governance uh, conditions. We need to add H, health. And we need, to, we, need to, we need coalitions of investors that say, we will invest in these companies and we will invest in innovation in these companies if it's going to improve health and nutrition. And finally, civil society. Civil society needs to become much more active around healthy diet issues. Um, where we, we, have, um, we have climate extinction rebellion, where is the nutrition extinction, extinction rebellion? So civil society needs to become much more active. With these five or six operating system changes and businesses being uh, responsible, alert, and nimble to the opportunities, I think we can affect real change. So I, I look forward to the discussion in the next two days, Steve. So over to you. Only to say thanks, everybody. We did really well on time. Look forward to seeing you same time tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It was great. Hi, Bibi. Thank Bibi you. Bibi from Joburg. Hi, Bibi. Hi. How, how are, are you? you all? Good, good. Great. Thanks, it was everyone. Wonderful. From Vera, really from Ghana. Thank Hi, you. Hi, Catherine. Look forward to tomorrow. Yes, sure. Hi, it's Bye. Bye.
Bye. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Hello, Anna. Okay, nice, yes. <laughs> nice meeting you from nice Ghana. You. Okay, great. Great. We'll meet one day. Yeah, sure. Okay. Bye. See Bye -bye. you tomorrow. Yes. Okay, bye.